So uh, my wife is Karen. We um, started uh, using essential oils about oh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, we love them so much that we um, decided that we were going to um, kind of embark on a journey together and doing a business together which has had its ups and downs, but much more ups than downs. And uh, we found out we worked really well together. And so um, I wasn't sold on any of it at all. Um, this chair and it took me about a month and a half um, when I started getting off some of my medications that I had been on for a long time. And uh, I was finally sold, and I said, this stuff's great. Um, I don't know why it's just women at these things, but um, I need to kind of uh, have a little paradigm shift. A little paradigm, at least be the try to be the catalyst for that paradigm shift and <clears throat> get men involved in, in essential oils because, again, I'll tell you, um, it's changed the way our family has done healthcare completely 100% changed it. Um, and I'm not and because I'm not going to get into this, but I'm not crazy. We do, we go to the doctor, we go every year, we do our checkups, we do all of that kind of stuff, um, but. We're certainly more informed about how our bodies work um, and some alternative things that even mainstream medicine um, is accepting and doing today. And so, and I'll get into a little bit of that as I go through um, um, the class tonight. Um, this is something I learned, um, I did corporate training for a long time, and so I learned this little trick and I want to ask questions beforehand. And I'll put them up on the whiteboard. If anybody has any questions, anything at all that has to do with essential oils or anything at all, I probably will get to it in the presentation. But if not, I can certainly weave it in. And so I found this kind of an interesting way to do it and get questions before it. Because I know everybody has some sort of a question about essential oils. So shoot. Someone be the first one. Otherwise, I have to. I might even. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll awkwardly wait. <laughs> Can I digest or take all of doTERRA? Can I ingest? Can I ingest them? Mm -hmm. Every one of them? I'm going to just abbreviate essential oil. Can I ingest essential oil? Get to that. the only question? Is it better, I have another one, is it better to use them full strength or like with um, coconut? Okay. Or how do you, how do you know? Um, okay, it's better the to use them, of so in the essential yeah. oil world it's called neat. neat, so better to use them neat or diluted yeah. or with a carrier oil. Right. Okay. Do they really work? <laughs> <laughs> Medicine. You got the can open, man. I've always been a very interactive teacher. I enjoy it. 
I think you guys will enjoy it more as well. Yes. <laughs> are they all fair trade made type thing? Plants and all of them. Yeah, where where do they come from? I got one. Yeah. What makes doTERRA different from other essential oils? Okay. Because I see them out there too. Um, and so as I go through the, the class, when we hit on one of these and when I answer one, I'll just take it off and I'll erase it. That was that's kind of the fun thing when I was in corporate training to do. Sometimes people answer the questions themselves, and um, the folks in training. So that was kind of fun. Any other ones that I don't have up there that you're interested in, I can have Karen write them down. All right. Well, let's move on. Question that no one even asks is what is an essential oil? Anybody have any guesses? Anybody have any thoughts? No wrong answers. Actually, no, there are wrong answers. I'm just <laughs> there are wrong answers. Or What's that? Oils from plants. Okay, oils from plants. Mm -hmm. It's the essence of a plant that's been steamed and condensed. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so the essence of a plant, it's actually a waste or a byproduct of a plant. So people sometimes will say, it's the lifeblood of the plant. Well, actually, no, it's really the waste of the plant. But it doesn't mean that it's not effective and useful. It's just, it's, just, it's like if we were to um, equate it to our own bodies, the, it would be kind of like the sweat. You know, it's necessary. We have to do it. Um, plants do it, have these things, usually for protective mechanisms or... Um, to keep predators away or to protect the outer layer. There's lots of different reasons that the plant actually has them and produces them, um, but it doesn't negate the fact that um, we can utilize those and we have utilized those for years upon years. Um, so the actual definition is essential oils are volatile, aromatic, non-water soluble, liquids obtained by steam or hydro distillation. So how does that work? So they take roots and stems and not every plant can be, uh, produces essential oil, but um, the ones that do, um, most um, when, you, when you're getting or deriving um, essential oils, most is done through steam distillation. So you take leaves, um, like for instance, wintergreen. Wintergreen, you take the leaf and you take lots and lots and lots and lots of leaves and you put them in a, almost like a pressure cooker, you, um, and you push steam through them and what rises to the top is going to be um, the actual essential oil and that's what we use and that's what, um, how those are derived. Now, citrus oils are a little different. Certain cold pressed oils, such as oils from various citrus peels, are also considered to be essential oils for traditional reasons, but the citrus oils are not non, uh, are the only non-distilled oils considered to be essential oils. So uh, grapefruit, um, lemon, lime, so they take the rind of those and they cold press those and that's how they, they get citrus oils. That's why when you, citrus oils are a little different. So in the summertime, don't put citrus oils <coughs> on your skin because they are photosensitive. And so you actually put those on, you don't want to go out in the sun because you will get burned. Um, um, so they are photosensitive. So those are the two ways that you that um, essential oils, and that's how we get essential oils. Um, do essential oils really work and how? So we're going to get to one of these. Which one was that? Number three. Three. I'm going to answer that one right now. So, who has seen Icy Hot? Uh, who has used Icy Hot? FDA approved, 
Walgreens and every Walgreens, every CVS, every corner drugstore that you have out here, here are all the ingredients. And so the active ingredients in um, Icy Hot are uh, one, 7.6% um, methanol and 29% um, methyl salicylate. Well, that's interesting. So wintergreen, anybody know what the active component in wintergreen is? 98% wintergreen essential oil is 98% methyl salicylate. So um, that is why people will take wintergreen. So is it a replacement? Is it something you can take out of your medicine cabinet? Well, sure. Like two drops of wintergreen oil mixed with the carrier oil um, can replace Icy Hot. And it's far more effective because there's 98% methyl salicylate as opposed to a 29% methyl salicylate. Um, menthol is derived from peppermint. So essentially, the two active ingredients in Icy Hot are peppermint essential oil, or a portion of peppermint essential oil, and wintergreen. And then at the bottom you have a whole bunch of inactive ingredients, and the most inactive ingredients in this are paraffin and white petroleum. Does anybody know what paraffin is? Mm -hmm. Wax. It's a wax. Does anybody know what the problem with paraffin is and parabens? They're carcinogenic. Mm. So the rest of the what is in your icy hot, and that's really to make it water soluble. It, it, that's really so that the oil that the methyl salicylate and the menthol doesn't come to the top and doesn't look weird. It just it comes out in a, in a cream essentially. And so those are, that's why you have those ingredients in there. It's really for um, ease of use. And so <clears throat> do essential oils really work? Well, yeah. I don't know, millions of people use Icy Hot for arthritis. They use it for all sorts of things. And so what the chemical companies have done and pharmaceutical companies is great. I mean, what they did is they, they recognize that menthol and methyl salicylate have great active components and they have great healing power and they have great ways to deaden nerves and things of that nature. It's a topical analge analgesic. And so <clears throat> because of that, um, they've taken it They've packaged it the way that they want to package it. Um, they've synthesized the methyl salicylate and taken it down to 29%, and they've synthesized the menthol, and they've created Icy Hot. Mm. So I ask you, why not just use Wintergreen instead? Mm. Because um, it works just as well on arthritis, it works just as well on um, aches, muscle aches, pains, things of that nature, and you're not going to have the carcinogenic side effects that you would with something that has parabens and white petroleum. So um, that's kind of one example of that. Next example I'm going to go to. Um, uh, anybody want to explain this? <clears throat> you. <laughs> um, I can't either. I'm just not. I'm really not studying. But um, this is actually a study um, done by the National Institute of Health. So they got, um, in 2014, December of 2014, this was published. Published. It's out on the web if you just go to like um, pubmed.com or pubmed.gov. Um, you can look up um, essential oils and uh, studies on essential oils or studies on frankincense. And I don't know, there's probably 17 different studies that were done in the last couple of years on um, essential oils and their effective effectiveness. This one happens to be um, it's a, their effectiveness on bladder cancer. And so they did this huge study along with um, Johns Hopkins and the National Institute of Health, and they found that um, essential oils and their constituents target multiple pathways. So this is just kind of a, a diagram of how they found that essential oils um, target multiple pathways and cancer cells. Essential oils, by virtue, have cell membrane permeability. So because um, essential oils, um, they are derived from <coughs> plants, our body doesn't look at them the same way that um, ibuprofen does. Okay, so ibuprofen is an isolated compound that our bodies don't really recognize. A chemical compound our bodies don't recognize. It's been developed over the last 50 years. And so our bodies don't understand that. 
um, frankincense, peppermint, those oils, our bodies have been around that for however long you think the earth has been around. Our bodies have been in, in contact with that, and so our bodies understand what that chemical makeup is. As complex as peppermint oil, as complex as frankincense is, our bodies understand what that, what that is. And so um, they have the ability to permeate what's called the, uh, the lipid layer of a cell. Um, and act different on a cellular, um, uh, cellular targets involved in various pathways. Um, and this is the kind of the interesting part right here. Essential oils increase intracellular, I have no idea what ROS and RNS is, levels which result in apoptosis. So what apoptosis is, anybody know? Hands, apoptosis. <clears throat> so yeah, so cell death. So natural cell die off. That's what's supposed to happen. The problem with cancer is cancer cells replicate, mm -hmm. okay? And so when bad cells replicate and replicate and replicate on themselves, that's when you get, uh, have problems such as cancer. Now, am I saying that frankincense will cure cancer? No, not at all. But what I am saying is that there are lots of studies out there that um, frankincense is known to um, help with cell integrity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so it will aid in the natural cell die off, which that's what you want when you have cancer is you want to be replicating good cells as opposed to bad cells. And so that's, that's, there's probably been 13 or 14 studies done on frankincense, um, certain types of frankincense, by the way. So there are three main types of frankincense, um, Cartiari, um, Serrata, and help me with the other one. It's on the bottle. Basilaria? No, that's the that's the actual uh, plant name, like the species name. Of the, but there's a. Uh, I'll look at it. I'll look at the bottle. It's on the bottle. You know it? No, but it's right here. I have it on the bottle. I should just look it up. It's right here. Um, so there are major um, health organizations, the government as well as like Johns Hopkins and major medical institutions as Mayo that are looking at essential oils and saying, hey, there are some really neat properties here. I mean, there's a reason why Purdue, the chicken manufacturer, is the largest um, consumer of um, antibiotics, has moved away from antibiotics. Did you know that? Purdue Farms is the largest consumer of antibiotics. And the reason is because they produce chickens. chickens. And chickens tend to get lots of bacterial infections, which wipe out whole. And so they used to put and um, back, um, they used to put antibiotics right in their feed. They stopped doing that because of um, antibiotic, you know, um, abuse, and and they were becoming the chickens were becoming resistant to the antibiotics, and so now they've switched over to oregano oil. And if you actually listen to some of their commercials, you'll they'll come out and say we don't use antibiotics any longer; we use oregano oil. Um, because the um, efficacy and the, the, the ability for um, their chickens, they saw no difference. In fact, they saw an increase in um, healthy chickens as opposed to ones that are, uh, were having issues with um, bacterial infections. And so do they work? Yes, they do. Um, Um, how do we use them? So there's really three different ways that we use um, essential oils. The first way would be um, aromatically. Aromatically would be diffusing them, smelling them. Um, right now, actually, I'd like to pass around peppermint oil. And this is a good way. And the way that I take one drop, <laughs> just wait for it. Fingers back, rub in your hand, just take a deep breath, and um, you'll see how it opens up the pathways, opens up your airways. Um, anybody know why, why using uh, um, essential oils aromatically works really well, and the effect they have on your body? Does, thoughts it, on that? does it elicit certain sensors in your brain? 
Yeah, and so your olfactory um, system or olfactory bulb is directly connected to the limbic system, which is where your memories are stored essentially in your brain. And so why do some people think, um, I'm going to, Normally, I don't like smells in stores. Like, I can't go into Bath, um, Bath and Body Works. Um, one, because they use all synthetic type of oils to, for their candles and everything else, and it just gives me a headache. Um, so I don't really like smells in stores, but there's one store that I really loved, and I have loved it ever since I was a kid, and it was the Disney store. Have you ever been in a Disney store, like in a um, major mall somewhere? Does anybody know what the Disney store smells like? No? It smells like Disney World. Okay? So, if it, and I have these memories of Disney World, because my family used to go there every other year, or every third year when I was a kid. We would drive down, my, parent, my grandparents lived in um, Fort Myers, and after we visited my grandparents, we would drive up to Orlando and we would go to Disney World. And there's this smell if you go into any of the shops in Disney World that has a unique smell and I think it's just where they have the toys and stuff manufactured but there's this unique Disney smell and I would go we're from Milwaukee area and so there's a mall just north of us and they had a Disney store and anytime I would go into that Disney store it would take me back literally I would be I, like my mood would elevate because all I could think about was that great times that I had at, in Disney World. Well, that is, that's what happens in, when you're smelling something, it will take you back into your memory, whether it's good or bad. And so, um, for instance, diffusing citrus oils, like oranges or whatever, what do you think that, what do people feel when they smell oranges? Happy? Energized. Clean. Energized? <laughs> yeah? Do you think of the sun? You know, like when you smell orange, like an orange grove, do you think of the sun? I do, because I think of Florida and orange groves. And so it's uplifting. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of the reason behind why um, working using aromatic compounds, or aromatic essential oils aromatically um, work in, in different ways. For instance, frankincense. So in the Catholic Church, it's been tradition for, um, I don't know, um, going on thousands of years now to use frankincense. You know, when they take it down the aisle and they're, you know, you can see the smoke coming out of, well, they use frankincense because it, it works, it's proven to work with focus. And so they want to do that during prayer times, so they would burn frankincense for focus. It's just known to do that. And so there's lots of different ways to aromatically, or different types of oils that you can use in a school setting or in your house or in your bedroom especially lavender is great to diffuse at night because many people love the smell of lavender and lavender is a very soothing and um, um, what's the word calming, calming um, scent so it helps get lots of people go to sleep it aids in that Topical use, so this is what we'll talk about, um, the different ways to use them topically. Um, it's for localized benefits. Obviously, we talked about wintergreen, and we talked about um, using it with a carrier oil. So anytime you're using an essential oil um, on your skin, anytime at all, always use a carrier oil. No reason not to use a carrier oil. Um, it's not going to um, change the effectiveness or the efficacy of the oil itself. What it's going to do, because they're, many of the oils are like, they're like solvents and they evaporate very quickly, it allows it to spread and, and actually absorb into the skin much faster. And so you always want to use a carrier oil. Um, and that can be any vegetable-based oil. So um, we use fractionated coconut oil. Um, fractionated coconut oil is basically um, coconut oil with the fat molecule pulled out and so it doesn't get white and hard, that's all. And it has very little smell and um, at all, very almost orderly, odorless. So <clears throat> fractionated coconut oil, you can use a jojoba oil, you could use uh, a grapeseed oil, um, you can even use canola oil if you wanted to. Um, 
but then it's pretty greasy. So you want to use something that's not greasy, but always use a um, carrier oil when you're using essential oils. And they go much further, so your oils will spread. Um, <coughs> any questions on that? Can you answer that? Better Which one did I answer? Meat or with the carrier? Yeah, and many of them you can. So, for instance, um, they're, they are, um, I'm having so many problems with words tonight. I know, I know. For instance, um, melaleuca oil. Um, melaleuca oil is great for blemishes, skin blemishes, things of that nature. So you can use that. And so like, for instance, if you have a blemish um, or a pimple or something like that, you can just use one drop of it and put it on, you know, right on the blemish. So you can use some, and they're very um, gentle, um, like melaleuca, it's tea tree, and it's very gentle, so you can use it. Want to, but if you're going to put it over a large area, um, always use a carrier oil. Okay. Mm. Uh, can you use too much topically? Um, I think. Um, do we have that sheet anywhere around the the dosage sheet? More isn't better. I'm just saying that. Um, I think the, the dosage is somewhere around 36 drops a day, uh, daily on your skin. I think somewhere around there. I'm, you don't have to count topically, um, but um, more isn't, isn't better. But certainly every three to four hours, like if you were using, um, for instance, anybody with like arthritis, things like that, I would suggest using frankincense, using um, wintergreen and peppermint together on like a knee or a joint or something like that with a carrier oil. You could do that, you know, every three to four hours, something like that throughout the day. You don't worry about any droppage or do dosage um, requirements. But 36 drops, I think, would be the most. Mike? Yeah? Why do you put it on the bottom of your feet? It oh. seems kind of strange. Yeah, so bottom of your feet, it's interesting. So. Um, your feet sweat a lot because your pores are large in the bottom of your feet. And so there is, um, <coughs> so people will put them on the bottom of their feet to get the oil systemic okay, easily. Um, they, um, a lot of times you have thick skin there, so if you have any oils that might be a little hot, cinnamon oil is hot, a hot oil. And so your skin on the bottom of your feet isn't going to feel that um, hot sensation. Okay, so, and there's reflexology points on the bottom of your feet. Um, so those are the reasons that people put them on the bottom of their feet. Any other questions? Okay. Um, internally, can you use, can you take and ingest um, some? So, for instance, um, On Guard, I'll pass it around. On Guard is a uh, uh, immune boosting blend. It has um, wild orange, um, some eucalyptus, it has um, clove. cinnamon, clove, yes, cinnamon. Yeah. Um, lots of things in it. But if you look at it, doTERRA does, has supplement facts on the side. So if you can ingest in oil, it'll always have a supplement fact, just like any other food product. It'll have a supplement fact on the side. <coughs> For instance, wintergreen. You can't ingest wintergreen. You can in very, 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 very small amounts. And so you'll see that in some blends, actually, you'll see wintergreen as one of the last ingredients in there. Um, so you can, but wintergreen can be toxic to the system in larger amounts. Um, mainly, if you were if you took a, if you were to drink two, I think I think it's thirty mil is where the toxicity level is. So it would have to be two bottles of wintergreen you'd have to ingest before it would really become toxic to your system. But um, DoTerra doesn't want to even take that step in that direction, and so wintergreen does not have a supplement fact on the side on, on it. So um, how much can you take? Twenty six drops daily is what is recommended. So the dosage would be twenty six drops, no more. Um, you have to watch it real close, and most people don't take that many um, drops. 
you can take them um, three ways in your water. And so I will often use peppermint oil in my water to soothe my stomach. Um, I've had acid reflux my entire life. Um, I just, I got off any acid reflux medication in May of last year. So just May or June, June timeframe, somewhere in there, I was on protonics. And through using um, peppermint oil in my water and then a digestive blend, which has ginger and um, peppermint and um, anise, anise. anise. Um, I would take that once in the morning and once at night in a, in a veggie cap and uh, pass those around. Just pass one of these around. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's already done. And you just, they pull open, and I would put them in, I would put a couple drops in, and take it down in the morning, and then take one down at night. And um, I weaned myself off of my uh, acid reflux medication in about a month or so, and I haven't been on it since. So I haven't taken any um, acid reflux medication. I haven't had heartburn once. So. Ditto. So there are ways to get yourself off of those medications. That's one of the medications that I got off of. One of the reasons that I'm doing this right now. Hmm. I'm gonna go into some of the oils. I'm gonna pass them around and just kind of go through some of the things that they're good for um, and what they'll do. Frankincense, we talked a little bit about frankincense. I'm gonna pass this around and you guys can smell it. Um, and here, I'm gonna get to look at the, the, the actual ingredients. So, where is it? It's on here. There are three different, so this is a blend. Um, Cartieri, um, Freirina is the other one, and um, Sacra. So those are the three different types of frankincense. The frankincense, true frankincense, um, is going to be expensive, only because there's only a couple places that it's grown, Somalia um, being one of them, um, Omar, so mainly in the Middle East, in very rocky, hilly country, hill countries, and it is, um, they, they get it from the resin of the tree, so they tap the tree, um, that usually are on, on mountain sides, sides of mountains, and that's how they get the um, the resin which is then steam distilled and that's how you get the oil itself. Um, so this is, our frankincense is actually a blend of those three different species. Um, good frankincense oil um, is going to run you anywhere from $65, $60 ever, about for 15 milliliters to anywhere from about 120 good frankincense. Um, you can get cheap frankincense but usually it's cut with turpentine. Turpentine is, you know, what they paint off with. And the reason behind that is because the active ingredient, one of the largest chemical compounds in a good frankincense oil is it's called alpha-pinene. Um, alpha-pinene comes in a good frankincense oil. The ke that chemical constituent is somewhere between 40 to 48 percent alpha-pinene. Um, so fairly high. Turpentine um, if you do a like a analysis of the chemical makeup of turpentine, it makes up about 80%. So alpha pinene, the chemical makeup of turpentine is about 80% alpha pinene. So they take turpentine, they'll put it half filled with turpentine, the bottle, and then they'll fill the rest up with frankincense because when you're doing an analysis, it, well, it's got alpha pinene in it, so it is frankincense oil, and it smells like frankincense oil, but it's not frankincense oil mainly turpentine. So that's one of the, the, the little tricks when you look at adulterated frankincense oil, like in a store somewhere, that's what you would find. So I'm gonna pass this around, you can smell it. If you'd like, has an interesting smell to it. Maybe it'll take you back to your Catholic roots. <laughs> Mass, so no. Um, so what's it good for? So frankincense is kind of known as the king of all oils only because its chemical makeup is the most um, complex of any essential oil. 
sometimes people say, well, can't you just synthesize it in a lab and make it? No, that's the whole point, is that it would cost them more to synthesize frankincense oil in a lab than it is to actually get it from the tree itself, just because of how hard it is to actually um, create the chemical makeup. So like, it, they can take parts of it, like they could recreate alpha pinene in a, in a lab and then add it to um, a bottle of frankincense. So they can isolate certain compounds, um, but you can't actually synthesize a whole um, essential oil in a lab. It's, it's impossible to do. Um, so what does it do? Um, cleans, cuts, calms. We talked a little bit about that. That's why the Catholic Church has used it for ages. It's calming. Um, it helps with focus. It supports immune function. <coughs> And it supports um, cellular integrity. Um, it has that ability to um, tell cells, bad cells, to die off. So cell integrity. Lips, mood, and awareness. Lavender. Lavender is a very calming and a gentle oil. Um, and I forgot to tell you that frankincense can be used topically, aromatically, and you can ingest. And so. Um, Often we'll just take shots of our frankincense, <laughs> knowing that it's good for you. It really is good for you. And so you can put it in a capsule. I would put it in a capsule. It doesn't taste very good. Um, but if and you put it in a capsule, tongue. you put it under your tongue. Or on the roof of your mouth. On the roof of your mouth. It's great for headaches a lot of times, that and Melissa oil. But if you have migraines, a lot of people will put frankincense right on the top of their yeah. mouth. Um, mm. So it can be used both aromat uh, all three ways. And we use it in our home all three ways. Um, lavender, all things calming. So use that all the time. There are lots of different li kinds of lavender out on the market today. You can get lavender um, almost anywhere. But most lavender out on the market is called, it's not lavendula, it is lavendin. It is a cheaper form and it's a cheaper species. It grows all over the place. Um, and so those are the things that are really important. Now I'll kind of get to that when you're looking at uh, essential oils and what type to get. We'll talk a little bit about that, but make sure they always have the, the Latin um, underneath on your bottles, wherever you're getting them from, um, because there are lots of different, like for instance, cinnamon oil, right? So you'll see essential oil coming from cinnamon. Most of it's not cinnamon plant. In fact, the cinnamon bark that you can get at the store isn't cinnamon, it's cassia which is a related uh, plant, but it's much cheaper and easier to get cassia than it actually is to get cinnamon bark. And so you gotta make sure that it has actually the Latin. Um, all things coming, great for um, burns, irritations, anything like that. Um, mosquito bites, um, mm -hmm. you can pass that around, the lavender. Grateful, restful. Uh, some people love lavender. My wife, would, she, we, you had sleeping problems, but lavender didn't work for her. Cedar wood works great for us, so we love cedar wood for sleeping. But um, most, a lot of people swear by lavender. Just swear by it, and um, so it's great for sleeping. Minor burns combat seasonal threats, so it's kind of a natural antihistamine. Um, lavender. So you'll see lavender blends that will include or. Um, Seasonal threats or allergy blends that include lavender, um, lemon, and lemon. And peppermint is, opens the airways up. Mike, could I mention right in there? I, yeah. You're aware that I've had some skin issues, yeah. itchy, mm -hmm. and I've been taking, I think, three drops of lavender, two lemon, and two peppermint three or four times a day instead of Benadryl works great and I'm yep. not in a fog <coughs> yeah. you know it works wonderful yeah um, yeah lavender works great as a natural antihistamine it has an antihistamine properties to it um, and that's proven and so yeah lots of people use that um, in fact doTERRA makes an actual capsule that has lemon lavender and um, peppermint in it already um, pre-packaged in a gel cap, mm -hmm. in a soft gel. Uh, 
Coca or tea tree oil. So you see that in everything these days, tea tree oil and shampoos, all kinds of stuff. I'll pass it around. Um, very, that's a very gentle oil as well. Um, <coughs> you can use that. You can actually ingest them. Look at them. Tastes good. Um, but a lot of people, it has a numbing effect to it. So a lot of people will take it and put it on a Q-tip. And if they have tooth pain, um, they'll put it right on the tooth. Um, that and clove works really well um, for tooth pain. And that's because it has that natural numbing agent in it. Um, great for healthy skin and scalp. And so if you have dandruff or anything like that, put some in your shampoo. Um, and that works great. Um, great for toenail fungus. That and oregano oil. So I would take, because I had that problem, um, melaleuca, <laughs> coconut oil, and oregano oil. Those three, they have great antifungal properties to them. Um, Johns Hopkins uses oregano oil all the time for um, uh, antifungal um, experiments and, and uh, some of the testing that they do. And those three um, cured my um, uh, toenail fungus over a three month period, it was about three or four month period. It takes consistency, um, but it works. I couldn't take Lamisil, which is the drug that they use um, to get rid of it because it's hard on my kidneys and I have a genetic kidney problem. And so my doctor said, stop taking it. And so this was the alternative and it worked great. Um, and it's good for healthy immune function. So some people put just in a, in a veggie cap and take, um, <coughs> take Melaleuca. Um, digestin, I talked a little bit about that. I don't know if we have, we do have that in there. So digestin is just a digestive blend um, that doTERRA has. It is anise, peppermint, ginger, all the things that you're, that anybody would say are good for your stomach and good for calming your stomach. Um, it has that in there. And so I would take it in a veggie cap. That's how I took them, took it. Um, it is amazing for nausea. So I, I never would believe it. I said, oh, no, if you have nausea, just take a couple drops of it, rub it on your stomach. Man, I'll tell you, it takes it right away. Um, it's fantastic. And they've used peppermint and anise in hospitals for years. So they give you a little cotton ball, and they'll tell you to just to put it to your nose. It works fantastic for nausea. So either smelling it, taking it aromatically, or actually putting it on your stomach works great. It has a nice cooling sensation, cooling and warming sensation. Um, great for motion sickness. People put it behind their ears for motion sickness. Um, so it's everything digestive. So if, uh, if you can't go or if you're going too much, take it internally. It will help. So I'm kind of going to get into... Um, Oh, we're going to erase some of these. Can we use too much? Um, yes, you can. I think I gave the dosages, right? Mm -hmm. 26 yeah, drops internally, 36 topically, and then you can you can diffuse, you know, to your heart's content. <coughs> um, some of that you'll get to. Does your body need to take a break? Um, how can they replace medicine? Some of those will just be in questions maybe individually, but they certainly did replace some things in the My Medicine cabinet. Mm -hmm. So if you have any other questions on that, I certainly can help with, with individual issues. Um, where do they come from? We're going to get to you. What makes doTERRA different? And does your body need to take a break? I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so um, why did we cho choose doTERRA? Well, I think part of it was um, when we had lice in our family. So the, our story with doTERRA and how we got involved with doTERRA and essential oils is um, our family got lice. <laughs> and it was a terrible, terrible predicament. It was horrible. I mean, everybody in the family got lice, had lice. And so we had a neighbor that was down the street, and um, her husband was a um, really well-known doctor in the area. And she came over and she gave us melaleuca oil, tea tree oil. She said, put this in your hair, the bugs will stay away. And so we did. 
and they, it worked. And um, so Karen looked at it and she said, oh, doTERRA. And so just took note of the brand. Um, we also had um, another person, another doctor's wife in the area, give us, um, what did she give us? Oh, a couple samples of something. I don't remember what it was, peppermint and a few other oils, and said, hey, use this for Mike's headaches, because I got tension headaches a lot, and use this for that. And she gave us the samples, we looked it over, and it was doTERRA again, so we started to look at the company, and started to look at um, that particular brand, and why, why doTERRA, why were two doctor's wives giving us this doTERRA brand? And so, um, so as we get, and so that's why we chose doTERRA amongst uh, the other research that I've done, but why doTERRA? So this particular pie um, shows us essential oils or oils as a whole, the essential oil market. So the vast majority of essential oils are synthetic or just isolated compounds that smell like peppermint. So for instance, like lavender. Um, what makes lavender smell like lavender? Well, it's a chemical compound called linalool. And so what they'll do to make your fabric softener or any products that say, hey, look, it's a lavender scented. They'll take linalool and they'll put it in um, detergent of some kind and it'll smell kind of like lavender, usually much stronger than lavender. The real lavender, it'll smell much stronger, but that's how they do it. And so most of the market, anything that goes in candles and then all kinds of things, it's all synthetic um, um, essential oils. Then you have um, a small amount that is food grade. And so things that, like, um, these would be absolutes or extracts that you would see in your toothpaste or that you would get in salad dressing or anything like that. They have food grade oils that go into those. They have no medicinal benefit. Most of them are synthesized, um, and, uh, but they are safe to be ingested. And so they are food grade. Then you have a small amount that are therapeutic grade. <clears throat> the FDA does not regulate um, essential oils. And so um, anybody can put, and you'll see it in Target and Walmart, they'll have a row now that has essential oils. And it'll say 100% pure essential oils. Um, and so you'll see that they'll be therapeutic grade. And that would be considered therapeutic grade. And doTERRA kind of went above and beyond, and they created their own standard, which is uh, certified pure therapeutic grade. Now, what does that mean, having your own standard for things? We'll kind of get into that um, here in a minute. Come on. There we go. Um, so how do I know I'm getting a good essential oil? That was kind of the question that I asked when I was looking at doTERRA. And so there are a few things. Um, stringent third-party testing is a must. Um, and that third-party testing should at least do five to six different tests on an essential oil to make sure of its consistency. Um, and that would be GC, um, uh, MS. Um, this is just almost like a smell test. Um, optical rotation, refractive index, specific gravity, carbon isotope 14 testing. You should at least have those, and uh, doTERRA does another three uh, different testing. And not on um, just samples that they get from um, the supplier and the farms, but they do it on the whole batch. And so <clears throat> that's important because if you get a sample in and then they send you the rest of the batch, you wanna make sure that the batch matches with the sample that they sent. Um, and so batch testing is important. And so if you look on the bottom of a doTERRA oil, you'll have a serial number and an expiration date on it. You can plug that serial number into a website called source to you and it'll come up with um, all of the testing, where it was done, and, um, and when it came from, that, when that batch. And so it'll go through the testing. And if it does not um, meet the stringent third-party testing, <coughs> which the batch goes to the third party testing before it actually hits doTERRA. If it does not meet that, they'll throw the batch of oil out. Last year, we were unable to get Melissa oil and we were unable to get Roman chamomile oil for almost a whole year because they threw out, the third party threw out millions of gallons of that oil, which 
meant millions of dollars, but we were unable to get it because it did not meet the third party testing. Um, where are the plants grown, which is important. Um, for instance, lavender. Um, lavender grows best in France and in Bulgaria, actually. So those are the two places. The climate is best, the soil is best. It's just like um, growing grapes, you know? Um, wines from France are known to be good, and Italy are known to be good. Why? Because the soil is right, the climate is right, um, and so the best plants grow in um, where plants grow best where they grow indigenously, and so um, that's why um, DoTerra has partnerships all around the world, and I think 23 different countries, most of which are third world countries, and I'll kind of get into that. Another thing as to why I like that, but it's important that essential oil has that third party testing. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the Latin plant names. They should be on the label. Um, I guarantee if you go to if you go to most stores, they're not going to have the Latin plant name on there. And the reason behind it is because it's easy to lavender smells just like lavender. They come from the same, but the actual properties of lavender are quite different than lavender, and so you can't expect the same benefit out of it. And so that's why. And lavender is, it can be grown anywhere, and so it is a much cheaper oil. Um, than a true lavender oil. <laughs> Same thing with like Kasha, or we talked a little bit about frankincense. And so you need to know exactly where the oil is coming from and that it's being tested uh, stringently. Um, <clears throat> another thing that really um, kind of spoke volumes to me is co-impact sourcing. So if you were actually to do a Google search on Forbes and doTERRA, uh, Forbes did a huge um, spread on what they call co-impact sourcing. Because oils, um, plants, they get these plants that grow indigenously, most of the countries that they're getting them from are depressed areas of the world, uh, third world countries. And so um, they came to this realization early on, about a year and a half into doTERRA's, um, um, after they started doTERRA, um, they were looking and they were throwing out batch after batch of vetiver oil. Vetiver oil is great for sleeping, it's, 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 a great, it's a grass, but it grows indigenously in Haiti. If anybody knows anything about Haiti, Haiti is a very poor country. And so um, the executives went down to Haiti and went to the vetiver fields and said, hey, what's, we're, we're not getting the quality, we're, getting, we're throwing out tons of vetiver oil. And um, it turns out they were harvesting early so they could get paid. And when you harvest early, the oil isn't as effective as um, when you harvest right on time. And so they decided at that point that because they're partnering with most of these, with these farmers in third world countries, they need to make sure that one, they're paying ahead of time, so they pay before actually the harvest is done. They um, create schools, they put wells in, they do, they, they go beyond what's called fair trade. And so Forbes took note of that and they did a whole thing on what, what they call co-impact sourcing. And so that, that made me feel really good about how doTERRA does business um, ethically around the world. And, um, they make sure, and that also helps, I mean, why they call it co-impact? It helps make sure that we have supply. Because, as you know, essential oils are becoming big. I mean, people are noticing that good essential oils work really well. doTERRA needs to make sure they have a supply, and that's how they make sure they have a supply, is they um, make sure they're partnering with good farms in countries where these plants grow indigenously. And so that was one of the selling points for me on doTERRA. Um, how does doTERRA work? Um, so some might say, so how do I get essential oils? How do I get doTERRA? Um, as you can tell, I don't, we don't really do a whole lot of sales here, but how do you, how do you get oils into the home? doTERRA works kind of like a um, Sam's Club or a Costco. 
So you pay $35 um, and that's your membership and you buy it wholesale. And some people would ask, well, how do I keep wholesale? Do I have to buy every month? So you have to buy one product every year to keep that wholesale pricing. So whether it's a lip balm that's $4 or $3, I don't know what they cost. What is it, what, how much the lip balm Five, is? Maybe. Whatever. So if you pay that, um, you keep your wholesale pricing for the whole year or if you get a kit or whatever it is or you buy five bottles of oil, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you have to buy one product um, in a calendar year from, from the time that you sign up. And so that's how doTERRA works. Um, you can also buy kits, and there's all types of different kits um, for all different types of needs and all different types of um, budgets. And so when you buy a kit, <clears throat> um, they waive the price of the, the $35. So you don't have to pay the $35, you just get the membership um, when you get a kit. And so this is the only time that you actually buy below wholesale. So you'd be buying below what I pay for our oils. Um, um, so if anybody has questions, feel free. Yes? What's the average shelf life? Um, some people will always say, oh, essential oils will last forever. Mm -hmm. But they don't. Mm -hmm. um, you'll go through the bottle before it's, it's gone. I think it's like eight to ten years mm -hmm. shelf life on essential oils, and that'll go down if you keep them in a very hot environment. Mm -hmm. And so don't. Mm -hmm. You can freeze essential oils; they will freeze. Um, mm -hmm. Like peppermint mm -hmm. will freeze, mm -hmm. um, but um, so the cold isn't going to bother them. The heat will bother them, and that will. Um, it might be five years or four years if you keep them in your car at 130 degrees or something <laughs> yeah. like that in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, they don't really have much of a shelf life. They do have an expiration date on the back of them, mm -hmm. and that's just required. That's all. And mostly for any of the ones that you can ingest, they have to have an expiration date on them. And it'll tell when they were bottled as well when you go to source to you. Any other questions? I think the citrus oils don't have that long of life, do they? Uh, no, citrus oils are a little um, uh, because they t they will go bad, but it's still about five years. And I don't know what the actual dates say on the, on the back of them, but this is fennel. 2021. Um, so they'll last longer than that, but I know they have to have, have one on there. Any other question? What's in my head? Um, oh, does your body need to take a break? Um, no, and you know why. So your body, <clears throat> people will say, okay, well, antibiotics have um, you can become resistant to antibiotics over time if you continue to take antibiotics. The difference between an antibiotic and an essential oil is uh, the chemical makeup. So chemical essential oil, the chemical makeup of an essential oil is so much further and more complex. So the plant world, nature does a much better job of making things complex than we can in a lab. And so your body cannot really get used to it. I suppose if you took, I don't know, clove oil over a 10 year period, maybe your body would build up some resistance to clove oil, but <clears throat> uh, usually not a concern. So you know, your body, um, you don't really need to take a break. Now, however, can you be allergic? Can your body have a reaction to an essential oil? Yes, of course it can. Um, I mean, people are allergic to all kinds of grasses and all kinds of things, so it, there'd be no reason that your body couldn't have a reaction. So discontinue using it if you do have a reaction to it. Um, use something else. So, but yeah, your body can have a reaction to essential oils. Any other questions? Man, I'm right on time. It's right at 8 o'clock. I did really good tonight. You did. You did really good. On time. I'm not saying I did on the content, but. Good <laughs> anyway, Mike. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> good content, too, bro. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Thoughts? Hit all of them. <laughs>